guys, welcome to Bar Z. My name is Stan. Uh, today I want to talk about uh, VFDs versus RPCs. That would be a variable frequency drive uh, versus a rotary phase converter. And when you should choose one and when you shouldn't choose one. And, you know, I get a lot of emails, I get a lot of messages over on Facebook, uh, and I get a lot of messages in my inbox on YouTube about how do I know when which to pick, you know, and uh, for phase conversion. Well, you have to ask yourself what you want to do with it. Uh, let's talk, everyone knows that I've got a bunch of VFDs scattered around the shop. And if I didn't do this for a living, first of all, I get VFDs either cheap or free. Uh, a lot of these VFDs I use are takeouts, so they cost me absolutely nothing. And I do industrial automation and controls for a living, so this stuff is second nature to me. If you don't have that kind of stuff at your disposal, converting a machine to a VFD is extremely expensive. Um, if you're using a VFD solely for generating the third phase, which they're all capable of doing that, if that's the only reason you're buying a VFD, you might as well go with a phase converter. Now there's two types of phase converters available. One's a static and one's a rotary. Uh, the static phase converters are pretty notorious for not making tagged horsepower. So if you plan on using all of your horsepower, all of your tagged horsepower, uh, you better stick with a rotary. So, you know, we've kind of gone through that. If, if uh, you know, if you have the time and the inclination to really dig into a machine, strip all the electrical out of it, and, you know, rewire it top to bottom, whole new control group, uh, new fusing, everything changes on a machine as soon as you switch it over to a VFD not just slap a VFD on it and go. Um, there's a lot to it. So if the only reason you're doing that is for three phase, you know, I'm going to recommend an RPC uh, for you. And there's two ways you can do that too. Um, you could do it uh, point of use, you know, one, one RPC, one machine. That's it. Or you can feed an entire shop. You can set up a distribution network where you have your main single phase panel you feed a, a one large RPC, and then that RPC feeds a distribution panel, a three-phase distribution panel, and you send that out to the shop to all your machines. So when you come in in the morning, you start the RPC, and you're ready to go to work at all your machines. Um, you know, and if you don't need speed control and all these other things that a VFD is capable of doing, I've said it before, VFDs are capable of so much, we barely use 10% of what they're capable of. So if you think, uh, if you think you're up to the task of doing the VFD, more power to you. But uh, as far, if I had all this to do over again, build my entire shop, ground up, um, I would probably go with a very large RPC out at the main service and distribute three phase throughout the shop. Another point I want to bring up is uh, machines come and go, and if you spend the if you bring a machine into your shop and you spend the time retrofitting it and getting it all fixed up with a VFD and getting it just the way you like it, and then maybe you don't really love the machine and you want something bigger or something different, machines come and go, and that's just a simple fact. Um, and you, but you've already got all this time vested into something that maybe you're not completely happy with, but now you've, you, you, you're, you've got a lot of time and effort tied up into this machine, and so you keep it. But uh, three-phase machines are all over the place, and they're actually cheaper than the single-phase counterparts. So, having said that, we've got a five-horse uh, VFD set up here. We've got a Baldor, and we've got a shipment from American Rotary and we're going to set up an ADX 5-horse uh, unit and turn this thing into a plug-and-play. I'm not doing a retrofit on this. This surface grinder's got a, uh, a Fuji VFD. Uh, it's running two motors. I had to do a very special control group for it uh, just to get this surface grinder where I was happy with it and to run on the single-phase power. It runs good, uh, but I've got a lot of time invested in it. I've got about three days worth of labor and time and uh, if I had to go out and buy all the stuff for it I probably would have spent three four hundred dollars getting the cabinet and the 
all the pieces I needed to, to make this conversion. So uh, it was three phase when it came in, now it's single phase. But let's get this thing out of the box, put together, and let's see if this uh, surface grinder will plug and play. And uh, no muss, no fuss, this machine can come and go, and my, my phase converter would be here, to, you know, waiting for the next one. All right, let's, uh, let's get this box open and get this thing assembled. Okay, so we pulled the motor out of the box and we've installed the rubber feet. That's pretty basic, pretty, pretty straightforward. We've got four uh, vibration isolator type feet here. And uh, they provide a nice grip so it can sit on the floor or anywhere convenient for you or on a tabletop. Um, or even in a cabinet of a machine would probably be okay. Now, uh, and this was a Baldor. Uh, you got the telltale open type grip group on the end. It's been rebranded to, to Gentech, which is American Rotary. Uh, but the first thing that strikes you is, what's missing? No shaft. So they used uh, the rear end bell twice, and the only thing special about the motor is, is, is the, uh, the rotor inside. Uh, it is an 1800 RPM motor, so it's a four pole. Uh, I'm sure they've done all their testing, whether it's uh, the high RPM two poles or the uh, four poles, what makes the best, uh, uh, the best generated third phase. So uh, the next thing up is uh, there's some brackets that come with the kit and they give you a pretty nice instruction sheet on how to mount all this and uh, we've got a control box that mounts on the top of this uh, but the way these studs are arranged is this needs to be like this and like this uh, but these studs need to be lengthened and these are uh, through bolts. And so we've got long studs over here, so th this is a through bolt, just a piece of all threaded rod that needs to be moved this way. And uh, then according to the instructions, it gets double nutted and those brackets get put on there. So uh, let me get that taken care of and then we're going to look at mounting the uh, control box up on top. Okay, we've extended our studs on this side. So we've got a little bit of a little bit of studly sticking out there, and according to our drawing, they want us to double nut there, uh, so it's not sitting down in this recess. If you look there, you can see they're down in a, in a kind of a recessed hole. And what it would do is, when we tighten the bracket, it would just do, uh, bend the bracket. So we're going to uh, run an extra set of nuts down there, which they give us in this handy kit. Yeah, I think we're going to do that at both ends because we, we, the same thing occurs at the other end as well. What's a nylock? It's got regular nuts in here too. Uh, we're supposed to use the nylocks on the uh, on the outer and the standard nuts on the inner. Standard. There's another plain Jane. Okay, so now our nuts are sticking out beyond this end bell and our bracket's going to go on as so. And we've got studs sticking out and our bracket is not touching our end bell so we're in pretty good shape. So from here out we just do a, uh, do they require any washers for this? They're not talking about any washers. Okay, so we're just going to use our, uh, our nylocks that they gave us. One, two.
All right, brackets on. Uh, next up, we got to get the control box and do some knockout work. Uh, we've got knockouts to pull out of the bottom. It looks like there's some slots, and they give us some uh, nifty little vibration isolators. There's a there's a captive nut in here, and that whole thing is flexy right there. So these are going to go between here and the box. Uh, electronics sure don't like vibra vibration. Uh, neither do capacitors, so uh, this is a good call on their point. They've got vibration isolation down here at the bottom, and they've also got the uh, control group uh, segregated from the uh, uh, vibration with the, these little isolators, so that's pretty neat. All right, let me go get the control box, get it prepped, and I'll uh, bring you back. Okay, now here at the bottom, you're going to see some slots here and here, and these are just knockouts, very similar to a regular electrical box. You just take a screwdriver and... Uh, and you know, give them a tap, and that that'll knock out in that uh, slotted pattern. And there's four of those. So there's two down there at the bottom, and two there. Now this is uh, this is our control box. It's, uh, it contains our running caps, our starting cap, uh, and all the lugs and connections for both the idler motor, my incoming power, and my outgoing power. But there's also some electronics there, and uh, I can definitely see where they want to isolate that from vibration. So uh, let me get these things knocked out, and we'll uh, we'll uh, get, get this guy mounted to that. Okay, so these little fellows pop out pretty easy. I've already got one out here, and all I'm using is the side of a pair of uh, linemans and a, and a big Klein, and they've got three attachment points: um, one at the little uh, side groove, and one at each end of the slot, and they snap out fairly easily. So what you want to do is make sure you, make sure you get them out of there. You know, they're, they're down inside, they're going to rattle and everything else. Make sure, you, make sure you fish those things out of there. They're just going to lay down at the bottom and rattle. They could short against something, so don't, uh, don't mess around. Get, get, your, uh, get your knockouts uh, clear of the work. All right. Okay, well we've got uh, the uh, uh, vibration isolators assembled the way they're shown in the picture. They're showing it right here on this one. And uh, what we've got is a, a carriage bolt with a, with a square base. Right here. A uh, fender washer. A lock nut with the serrations uh, facing towards the flat washer. And the vibration isolator bottomed out in there. And what these are supposed to do, uh, that's what this little second slot is for. We're supposed to be able to take this. Let's see how this does. We're supposed to just be able to hook it in there. Oh, look at that. And then it lines up with that slot. And then we can tighten from down here, and that nut is captive. We don't have to go inside the panel with a pair of pliers or anything and do anything silly. So that's uh, actually pretty cool. Okay, well, pretty painless there. It just dropped right on those holes. And you can see our slotted holes there. After we uh, tighten everything down, everything's going to snug up really good. Um, we're going to use the supplied washers and locks to uh, uh, do our studs right here down into our bracket and uh, finish mounting this thing up. All we got left to do after this is wire it. This is complete assembly. So that's the whole, uh, that's the whole Marianne right there. Okay, uh, let me get these nuts on and uh, we'll start some wiring. Okay, so uh, we've got our mounts done. There's our uh, vib vibration mounts under there. So our whole upper box, I don't think you can see it, but it's you know, wiggling independently. Plus we got a we got the bases uh, doing the hippity dippity, so the whole thing's got a nice, uh, nice flex to it. We don't have to worry about damaging any electronics or anything. And uh, now we need to get from the pecker head of the motor up to the terminals, and uh, they've even supplied us with a cord. So I've got a uh, looks like a ten, yeah, it's a number ten AWG uh, SO cord for conductor. So there you go. Pretty nice. You don't have your choice of colors, but you know what? The electricity has no idea what color the wire is. So we're gonna use green for ground, that's a national standard. Red and black is all good. Whites are only odd dog. So we'll use, uh, the way I'm gonna do it is phase A is gonna be black, phase B is gonna be red, and then phase C is gonna be our, our white feller. All right, but they've uh, even given us fittings. We've got Nemo 1 fittings there. One for the pecker head, and then I got a knockout in the back, and that dude's just gonna go just like that. 
You're even nice enough to crimp lugs on the end for me. All right, so let's uh, let's get the let's get the idler motor wired, and then the rest of it's up to us. We have to provide the wire for the input and the output. And uh, what he's done for me, he's, he went ahead and installed a receptacle here that actually fits my machine. So I got all I have to do is go from the lugs to that recept, and my machine just plugs right in there. Uh, but the supply cord coming in to, to feed the thing is by me. So I'm going to have to supply my own SO cord and my own uh, plug. But uh, no big deal. I Strangely enough, I know a guy. We'll find that cord. All right, man. Uh, let's get this thing wired. Okay, so we got our uh, cable installed. We got our uh, NEMA 1 connectors in. We've got our cables ready to go into these three lugs, black, red, and blue. And we're going to be using black, red, and white. Now, uh, we're going to use our old friend, uh, Nokalux. Uh, why are we doing it? We got copper here, we got aluminum there, and we got uh, steel CAD plated set screws. So we got three different metals there, uh, dissimilar metals, and then to add insult to injury, we're going to pass some electricity through them. So we are going to put Nokalux on these connections. You should always put them on dissimilar metal connections. And you can just wipe this into the wire, into the stranded wire. Uh, some guys say take a little wire brush and brush it in, but I've gone back on jobs that have had no Colux on them, you know, five, six years later at maybe a beach city where we get salt air uh, with no corrosion problems. So we're going to just get our guys in here and and tighten firmly. Lost a couple there. There we go. Okay, I love motor connected. Um, downstairs, let me lower you guys down. They're going old school on us. They've already crimped terminals on our uh, on our uh, motor leads. And they've already crimped terminals on these leads. So they, this is the old style nut and bolt connection. And this is how I was taught way back in the day. So I'm going to show you a new way how to make pecker head connections uh, using lug to lug with nuts and bolts, varnished cambric, and rubber splicing tape. Uh, let me go get uh, my tape and stuff and I'll uh, bring you back for that. Okay, we're all set to make these uh, screw connections. We've got our uh, Got a roll of varnished cambric, which is almost like a cloth tape. It's got a steep, a very sticky back. You can see the sticky on it. Uh, this provides abrasion resistance and toughness. Uh, varnished cambric is a good first layer. Following that up with rubber splicing tape. <clears throat> uh, we've got scissors. I can't find my uh, splicing scissors, so uh, there's going to be hell to pay from someone because they're missing out of my bags. And then we've got our nut and bolts that uh, American Rotary sent us. And let me show you what they're using. They're actually using the, the nuts with the little serrations on them. So pretty cool. Uh, our wiring diagram's right here. And we're going to be wiring low volts. And it, uh, according to this, uh, 4, 5, and 6 go together. And they've already kind of pre-taped some stuff together for us here. So uh, those three leads, these should be, uh, what, 4, 5, and 6. That's 5, 4, 6. All right, so these three guys go together. I'm just going to put a dab of Nokalux in between. Uh, so we got uh, this is nickel wire, and then we've got uh, some CAD plating going on there too. So we're just going to take a nut and bolt, and go through all three of these lugs, and these go, don't go to any of the connections, no lines or anything. They just uh, connect together. They're the, they're the taps for the uh, for that delta. So we're just going to take two wrenches and double wrench this thing down uh, till tight. And like I said, this is the old school way to do it. I haven't done motors like this in a very, very long time. Um, not a whole lot of places require it anymore. But it's pretty cool that they do it this way. I've seen very few failures uh, making motor connections like this. A lot of the Europeans still do this. Okay. 
So that's the connection there. It's three wires brought together with a nut and bolt and a, get your serrated uh, washer under there. We got Nokolux in between the, uh, on the heads of all those uh, connectors. Uh, now we're going to just take a length of varnished cambric and literally this stuff cannot be torn. It's like uh, taking some uh, <laughs> some of that packing tape uh, and saying, here, tear me off a piece of that, that fiber strapping tape. And what you're doing is you're providing some abrasion resistance to this connection here just by giving it a layer of varnish cambric. And it sticks to itself, it's conformable, but you never want to leave just this. But this gives us some good puncture resistance. Now we're going to follow it up with some rubber splicing tape and seal the connection. So we're going to start from the bottom, bring all three of our wires together tight. We're going to wrap on the way up. I can see why people hated these connections, but uh, a lot of the newer electricians these days never even saw, uh, saw this connection ever. And you want to get a few wraps over the top this way uh, to give that end some, uh, some good insulation. So you've started from the bottom and you've worked your way towards the top. And you've given it a few very nice wraps and now we're going to work our way back down to the bottom. And we brought all three wires together very tightly. We're going to cut and now we're going to seal. Uh, so I've, I've in one continuous wrap I've gone all the way up to the top. I've made sure I've gone over that top several times to give me good insulation there and then I wrapped in the same continuous piece I wrapped it all the way back down to the bottom so double pass uh, tie wrap on the three wires and uh, put your put your dikes on there ready to cut but use that as leverage to pull pull your tie wrap tight cut that connection there no air can get in it it's got no collux in there so it can't corrode and it's a nutted and bolted connection. We don't have any worries about that coming apart. The only thing that could ever fail inside this connection is actually the crimp of the actual uh, ring terminal. But uh, that's the old school way to wire motors. So I'm going to finish up these other connections here and uh, get this buttoned up. I just wanted to show you how to do nut and bolt connections in a pecker head. I've never demonstrated that on the channel. So uh, let me uh, finish this up and I'll bring you back. Okay, well, we've got our connections made and we're ready to drop all this into the pecker head. The only thing left is the ground and uh, we're just going to put a fork terminal on that and hit that ground screw. There's a ground screw down inside the pecker head. Gee, I guess it would help if I took the cap off. So, no collects again. Just wipe it in. Best crimpers in the world are your Klein Linesmen with that stake on on the side. What makes them so special? I don't know if I can get, even get the lens in there to look at it. Uh, you can probably see the double hump in there. I'm going to see if I can get this on there and show you what it looks like after that's been crimped. Load your tool as so with the stake at the top where the brake is. Drop your wire in. Check on the other side, make sure your wire is flush as so and you got massive amounts of leverage with these things. I'm going to try to show you what kind of crimp that makes. See so we can zoom you guys in a little bit here. I'm hoping you can see that double crimp on there. Yeah, the camera's kind of blown out. But, good solid connection. Uh, that's uh, Nokolux, hand crimper, ready to ground. That, you'll pull that wire in half before that crimp comes loose. All right, so we're ready to fold all this up and put this back in the pecker head and cover this up. And then we're ready to do uh, some of our field wiring for the uh, for the rest of the uh, RPC. Okay, so we got our internal wiring done. It's uh, red to red, black to black, 
And then over there, blue is our generated phase. That's the one coming off the idler. And then we're going up here to this uh, receptacle that was already installed uh, within the unit. And this is just number 10 THHN stranded, uh, available at any uh, uh, home supply store. All right, so that's the internals of it. I'm going to leave it open until we make sure we got our phases right. Uh, let's talk about the power supply. Uh, the power supply, I'm plugged into a 240 volt single phase. Um, I've got number 10 wires running over to this uh, receptacle, but at the other end I've only got a 20 amp breaker and this is only a 20 amp rated recept. So uh, I'm due for an upgrade at both ends. The wire that's in there is already adequate for the uh, larger breaker and the larger receptacle. But I need to change out this receptacle, uh, this cord end, and then the breaker over at, uh, over at the panel. And then I'll have a full 30 amp circuit feeding this thing. But uh, see what we got here. Off, run, and start. I guess the start's momentary. And they give us a light. I'm guessing that's going to light up when our capacitor is charging and starting the motor. This motor, we don't care if it runs forward or backwards. It's going to make that third phase no matter what, which way you spin it. So I don't really think we care which way that thing spins. Um, what we don't know is if we have uh, our surface grinder phase correctly. Uh, what have I got? A 50-50 chance? Let's uh, fire this off. Okay, see our light went out, so our, our uh, capacitor charged, discharged, started the motor, and uh, now we're up and running. Um, well, we're going to know which way by, uh, which way that spindle's turning, huh? Uh, let's just go into manual first, and then uh, let me find a piece of paper. The bottom of our wheel should be going that way. Which it is. And you see it pushing it over that way. I can feel the wind blowing it over here. Okay, well, so we're spinning in the right direction. Uh, and I know both motors were phased correctly. That motor down there, uh, that's the hydraulic motor. So let's uh, turn on the hydraulics and uh, get some juice flowing. All right, I heard that thing kick. So the hydraulics are running. Uh, I'm just going to crack this and let it bleed off because I did uh, let it burp the air out of the system. I can hear it burping back there. There it goes. Alright. There you have it. And now all I need to do is find a home for the uh, uh, for this phase converter. I think this thing's going to live. I'm not going to let it sit on this side. This is the dirty side of the grinder. I'm probably going to mount it down uh, down low by that hydraulic unit. Alrighty. But, uh, wow, we even got the phase uh, going the right way. Let's uh, button this up. Okay, guys, well, that's the uh, end result of the rotary phase converter for a point of use. This is uh, one phase converter, one machine. This is not feeding an entire shop. So, uh, good little unit. Pretty impressed with the uh, uh, detail that went into, you know, everything they sent. And the kit was very complete. And everything fit together nicely and uh, didn't give me any problems. Um, we saw the machine running. Uh, what, I, what I was going to talk about real quick is the, uh, the amperes. Uh, it pulls just a, a, just a shade uh, under an, a one amp uh, when it's sitting here idling, just like, like that. Just sitting here idling, doing nothing. It's not running any machines or anything. But uh, uh, when the machine starts, it pulls, you know, another... Overall, it's about four amps for everything between the, the, the phase converter and then the actual machine running. So. Uh, Nothing out of the ordinary, you know, it doesn't, it's not pulling any monster power. But uh, if you have a machine that you don't require speed control on, or any special kind of control groups, or any special requirements, there's absolutely nothing wrong with going with a rotary phase converter. Um, I hope this answers some of your questions. I know I've taken a lot of questions over on Facebook 
and on emails, uh, should I go with a phase converter or should I go with BFDs? And I always give different answers depending on people's needs. Uh, maybe you have a mill, but you got a variable speed head. You don't need speed control. Uh, the only thing you'd be using a, a VFD for is to generate the third phase. Get one of those. You, you, you just don't need to go with the VFD. So every situation is different. And uh, always look at uh, you know, what, what you want to do versus what you're going to spend on a rotary or what you're going to spend on putting a control package and rewiring your machine uh, for a VFD. But if you are interested in our rotary phase converter, contact the guys over at American Rotary. Uh, tell them Barzi sent you. All right, we'll talk. We'll talk to you guys later. Thanks for watching.